I want students to understand the first thing that you said, which mm-hmm. we talk about all the time on the MCAT podcast. The best way to prepare for the MCAT is to. Adam, welcome to the MCAT podcast. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm good. It's great to be here. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. It's great to be here with you today. I love this new format where I get to interact with a bunch of you Blueprint MCAT Live Online instructors to pick your brain and really understand from your perspective what the MCAT's all about, how it kind of Mm -hmm. fits into the pre-med world, and uh, hear your story a little bit. And then in our next episode, we'll dive back into full length one from Blueprint to MCAT. So let's let's start with you. Obviously, you did relatively well on the MCAT or else you wouldn't be a Blueprint MCAT live online tutor. I, I, I'm, I know for a fact that they have a cutoff on what your score can be. Uh, uh-huh. And then obviously making sure that you can teach that as well. Um, why do you think you did so well on the MCAT? Mm, so... That's a, a tough question to answer. Um, I think honestly, the reason why I would say I did the best is because I had a really good undergraduate like preparation in the sciences um, and psychology as well. So really, I had a pretty good content um, underpinnings. I actually was very, very unique in terms of preparation. Um, you might think this is crazy, but I only prepared for like, I think like four and a half weeks before wow. I took my MCAT. Um, and my preparation was like exclusively taking full length exams. Mm-hmm. Like I, I would, my procedure was, I would take a full length exam one day, I would review it the next day. And then the day after that, I would spend just like diving into content online, like that I had realized I needed to work on, uh, after going through the full length. So yeah, really I, I was a very full length heavy preparer. Um, mm-hmm. and so I, I was really comfortable with the exam and like the, you know, just like, test taking strategies. And I've always been sort of a pretty good standardized test taker, um, as far as, you know, endurance and, uh, you know, just like strategies that, that you work on with standardized exams. So I think, you know, it, it comes down to like my comfort with just taking exams and, um, having a pretty good, uh, grounding in content. Cause I didn't, I didn't give myself a ton of time to, um, you know, review a lot of content. Those four and a half weeks, was that full-time MCAT prep or were you busy doing other things? So uh, I did it over winter break. Okay. I had planned actually, so it wasn't, it wasn't <laughs> planned. I, I had intended to prepare more because, you know, I always like the MCAT is a monster and you need to prepare for it well. Um, I just found as I was going through uh, my fall semester that a lot of the stuff I was doing in classes was sort of, you know, like related to uh, a lot of what MCAT uh, prep is like anyways. And mm-hmm. so I didn't, you know, I th- sort of thought I could kill two birds with one stone and just, you know, focus on my classes. And that would be sort of like a lot of my content prep. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, cause I, I had been trying to do some sort of, you know, MCAT. I, I didn't like buy a course or anything like that, but I was in some books, uh, that some friends had lent me and things like that. Um, and I realized pretty quickly because I'm also, um, an athlete here, that I like could not just do it. I literally didn't have the time. Uh, so I, I decided I was just going to shift it all to winter break. Um, <laughs> so I started studying like December 15th and my exam was January 19th. Um, and it was pretty much, uh, somewhat of like a full-time thing. Like my schedule would be like three days, pretty much full-time stuff. Um, you know, roughly like, you know, taking the exam and reviewing the exam basically is like, in an eight hour gig, um, Mm -hmm. roughly. Um, and then reviewing the content the next day would be something in the, in that ballpark. Uh, And then usually the fourth day I always gave myself a break that, so as my schedule, take exam, review exam, review content, take a break. So those were my, that was my cycle. Uh, And I think I got through like 12 exams or something like that. Wow. Yeah. Lots and lots of tests, but I, I want students to understand the first thing that you said which Mm -hmm. we talk about all the time on the MCAT podcast, the best way to prepare for the MCAT is to do well in your classes, Mm -hmm. right? That was your foundation. So many students will not do well in their classes, not remember anything from their classes, 
and don't have that foundation coming in to then go jump straight to full length exams and and do really well like you did. Mm -hmm. And so many students need to go back to the content and restudy it and relearn it. And obviously you you were doing that post full length mm -hmm. exam for for the things that maybe you forgot or whatever. Um, but so many students miss that first part. Do well in your classes. Yep. Don't just take the classes to get good grades, but actually understand and learn the content first in those classes mm -hmm. and then go crush the MCAT. Yeah, super crucial to, you know, it's even sort of like if you if you want to look at it from like an efficiency perspective, you don't want to be trying to, um, you know, like you're spending all that time in, in the classes. You might as well, you know, give it your all and like be able to understand the content so that you don't have to spend a ton of time later you know, basically duplicating effort. Um, yeah. Because no one likes no one likes to feel like they're studying the same stuff they've they've done already. <laughs> that, that, that's that's no fun. I, I hate repetition. So yeah, no yeah I definitely no can understand that. Oh yeah. So that that's a key thing, and I'm I'm glad you mentioned it. And and guess what? That's free theoretically, right? Is, yeah. In yeah, terms exactly. of MCAT prep, doing mm -hmm. well in your classes, you're obviously paying tuition for those classes, but that's free MCAT prep. And, mm -hmm. and who, who doesn't want free MCAT prep? Yeah. It's, it's important to not sort of like, you know, delineate between the two, like what you're learning in your classes is what you're going to be test. Well, you know, not exclusively, but yeah. la largely, um, what you're going to be learning in your classes is going to be reflected on the MCAT. So yeah, definitely make sure that you're not duplicating effort in that regard. Yeah. What's, what's one of the biggest mistakes that you see students making? So preparation definitely being, you know, too narrow. Um, a lot of people, like, especially when you're, you're taking like a longer approach to preparing and you have like four to six months or something like that. Um, some students get really discouraged with like discrepancies in their full length scores. Um, like maybe, you know, you start with a diagnostic and it's like, I don't know, like a 498 or something like that. Um, and your first full length comes back and it drops two points. Um, that can like seem like it's heartbreaking, right? But there's a lot of like sort of confounding variables in there. Like the full length is a lot longer than a diagnostic exam. And, yeah. you know, even though you, you're doing some some content prep, you might not have that endurance yet. And there's just, there's still a lot of like strategies that you need to learn to go, uh, you know, like move through an exam, like with efficiency and, and vigor, as I like to say, that's one of my favorite words. Um, because moving through an exam, like it's like, uh, trying to think of an analogy from one of my favorite movies, an analogy for like taking exams is like you're moving through a jungle and you got to, you just got to like keep the pace up. If you let yourself like sort of fall and your en energy drop, that can sort of reflect in, in um, you know, how you're performing as well. And a lot of people don't realize that going from diagnostic to full length is a lot different. Mm. Um, and then just, you know, generally speaking, there's going to be, you're, you're not going to see a consistent trend. You're not going to get three points better every single time you take a full length. So um, I think to like put that in general terms, just having too narrow of a view in terms of their preparation is, is something that I see a lot. Um, it, you know, to get more like specific, I see a lot of students falling for like the prototypical trap answers that the MCAT likes to throw out there. Yeah. Um, a lot of people fall specifically on the cars section um, the MCAT loves to throw like outside opinion answers in there to sort of just trap people who aren't actually reading or like, you know, basing their answers in the passage. They're bringing in like their opinion on the topic or something they've heard about the, you know, like philosophy or something, um, from outside the MCAT. I see that super regularly. And even I noticed that with myself, it's, it's hard to prevent yourself from like bringing in yeah. how you feel about a topic when you're answering. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, when you when you recognize something, you're like, oh, that must be it. <laughs> I'm like, well, wait a minute, yeah. that's not quite right. Definitely. Yeah, it's it's so important. And what you talked about in terms of kind of test to test, there's so much angst and anxiety around my score didn't go up, I'm plateauing, it dropped a little bit, and and it's such an easy kind of comparison to weight loss when when someone's trying to lose weight, the scale doesn't always go down. Yeah. But when you zoom out and you look at the trends, it is going down and down and down. And, and when you zoom in, you can see little fluctuations up, down, and all around. Mm -hmm. But but students 
can't really think about that because all they think about is the score must be lower, the score must be lower, the score must be lower without zooming out and going, overall, how am I doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So important. Yeah. I de it, it is super important. And, and it's so hard too. It, like it, it's easy, you know, it is easy for us right here to be you know, <laughs> like sitting back and saying, oh, you need to be looking at the, uh, you know, look at, look at the long haul, look at the big point. Um, but yeah, when you're, you know, so emotionally invested in like preparing for this exam and uh, for a lot of people, it's like, you know, sort of the precursor to something they've wanted their whole lives, like to become a physician, it's hard to take that step back and, um, you know, sort of look at it with an, with an objective eye. So I definitely understand, you know, having been that person with the emotional attachment to like, you know, improving and, uh, yeah. you know, you, you want to, you want to see the improvement every exam, but it's just, it's not always feasible. Yeah. Why did you want to be a doctor? Why do you want to be a doctor? Um, I love people, uh, honestly. So, I mean, there's there's a lot of ways that I could answer this question. I could give you my prototypical, uh, my med school interview uh, answer. But honestly, it just comes down to the fact that uh, like people are at the center of like everything I value. Um, and I think I don't think there could be a better use of my time than like giving people's health back to them. So that's my... That's my short elevator pitch for why. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You have any ideas on a specialty at this point? Um, I'm an athlete, so I've always wanted to work with athletes. So I've been thinking orthopedic, uh, you know, something in that realm. Um, but honestly, I'm, I'm very open to it. Yeah. Um, my whole life, actually, like my family has always had a joke that I should become a brain surgeon. Um, <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe I'll consider that as well. But yeah. that's, a, that's a pretty long residency path. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Working with athletes, it's, it's interesting. I don't think a lot of people understand there are lots of paths to working with athletes, obviously ortho being mm -hmm. the, the stereotypical one, Definitely. but with, uh, uh, physical medicine, rehabilitation or physiatry, mm -hmm. uh, becoming more and more popular. That's a huge sports Avenue. And then just sports medicine through either family practice, internal medicine, there's, there's lots of options, um, mm -hmm. it, depending on where you're going. Even now with concussions being a thing, you could be a neurologist as being a, on the sidelines for an NFL team. Yeah. That would be pretty awesome. So lots and lots of options to work with athletes. Certainly, certainly. I know a lot of, uh, I think one of my friends actually, he's, um, he's doing a master's program, uh, I think at university of Toronto right now. Um, but he, he wants, I think that's exactly what he wants to, to, um, to do is, uh, I think neurology and like do something along those lines, uh, working with athletes and like concussions and whatnot. Yeah. Very cool. All right. Well, let's get back to the MCAT since this is the MCAT podcast. Indeed. <laughs> uh, working with students as a, um, as a MCAT live online instructor, mm -hmm. students using a course, where, where do you think students are? using the course to the fullest extent and where are they potentially falling short? So one of the really unique things about Blueprint um, is, you know, the like individualized study plan. Um, and I think sometimes uh, that can really, you know, w whether or not people are using that to the full potential is something that I think uh, dictates whether they're going to have like success, success or not, like using uh, the online platform, because that's sort of like, the accountability measure, right? Mm. If you're, um, I mean, and, and it boils down to just like personal, um, you know, if they're invested or not, certainly, but that's reflected in whether or not they're keeping up with the study plan. Um, and I find because content is sort of really heavy in the beginning of our course, and it sort of gets lighter as we go on, um, if people get behind in the beginning of the course, it, it can be somewhat of a snowball effect in terms of like, you know, being behind on material. Um, so pe students that I notice are successful are the ones who are completing like all the modules, um, and coming to, you know, each, each course, like prepared with the material, um, and where people, you know, I, I've been noticing are falling, not falling to the wayside. Um, but you know, struggling is, uh, when they aren't necessarily putting, when, when they aren't necessarily, you know, completing all the sort of prereqs that you need to do to, you know, have the content under underpinnings. And then we talk about how to sort of use the content in the course. So, yeah. Why do you think students do that? Because it's a common, whether you're using a course or not using a course, students, in, in my mind, they, they try to kind of brute force the MCAT and go, you know what, mm -hmm. I'm smart. 
whatever the content's the content, but I'm just going to go in and figure it out. It seems like that's a common mistake that students make. And then the MCAT punches them in the face and says, ha ha, you cannot do that. Yeah, there, there's just, so I think one of the sayings that I, I hear a lot is that the MCAT is like a mile, a mile wide and, and an inch deep, right? Yep. Um, and you need, you need familiarity with, you know, like how, how the MCAT is structured and how they sort of present the content to you, because it's not just understanding the content, it's understanding the exam as well and how it's structured and how the AAMC wants to test you on the content. So almost as important as understanding the content is understanding how it's going to be presented to you. Mm. Um, so when, you know, when people are, are sort of going at it with that uh, brute force mentality, they're sort of missing the um, maybe like the second component of it as well. And they're also sort of just you know, not addressing the, uh, the fact that, um, there's a mile wide <laughs> content. Like when you say a mile, a mile is probably maybe two miles, three, I don't know. Yeah. You know, this is an, an analogy, but wow, there, there's so much content is just incredibly broad. A lot of stuff there. Oh, cool. I, I want to wrap up here so we can get back into uh, some more content Mm -hmm. for full length one what is your number one tip for a student out there beginning their journey on the mcat number one tip is don't feel bad about getting things wrong especially in the beginning i mean you should never really uh view like failure um as something to run from and it, it's sort of like a cheesy uh tip but i really think it is important um something that i think successful students um like it, it's sort of a trait for successful students is realizing that when you make a mistake, that is the area, like you shouldn't run from mistakes because that is where you're going to find your score improvement, sort of diving into your mistakes and understanding why uh, you're, you're, you know, getting things wrong or, or what your uh, misunderstandings are. So just not being afraid of your mistakes, recognizing them, and then working within the areas where you're weak, because those are the areas for improvement. Mm. 